Hallelujah. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. It is great to see you on today. Amen. Amen. Great to see you. Our text is found in the bulletin. I want to thank everyone who served and helped on yesterday during the homegoing service. For Brother Cooney Williams, amen. You are an awesome, wonderful people of God who serve sacrificially. So I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Amen. Great to see you. In the bulletin, you'll find the text taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. If we uh, just wanted to stand and read for half an hour, we could read the whole chapter. But we're not going to do that. But I do challenge you and encourage you in your quiet time to go ahead and read chapter 6 for it constitutes the context from which we're going to preach. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Hallelujah and praise God for his spirit. It reads like this, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Now he had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide and three cubits high and had placed it in the center of the outer court. He stood on the platform and then knelt down before the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. He said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it. As it is today. Now Lord, God of Israel, keep your servant David my father, before you, promise you made to him when you said you shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law as you have done. And now, Lord, the God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David come true. And now, Lord, God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David come true. For a few moments, we want to look at the subject, pray like a champion. Would you say that to your neighbor? Pray. pray. Say it with a little enthusiasm, maybe a smile. Pray like a champion. Amen. Amen. I mean, don't worry. We'll bounce back. Amen. Amen. Uh, pray like a champion. Pray like a champion. And God, afresh, we confess that we need your help, Lord. We are a mess without you, God. Intervene on our behalf. Speak to us and through us so that we might hear from heaven, God. We love you, God. And we know that you do all things well. We know that you are faithful. And we know that it's your Holy Spirit, it's your spirit that preaches and teaches. You are the voice. You are uh, the true one. No man, no person, no woman can speak like you speak. So, Lord, speak to every heart. Solo door, be O glory, in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said amen, amen. and praise God. A champion is someone who gets in the fight, but not for themselves, but for someone else. A champion steps in, not so they can win, but so they can win for someone else. And she was known as the Moses of her day. Harriet Tubman, she was a, a gospel preacher with papers and all. She decided, once she was freed from slavery, to go back 19 times. And she was going back to the South, wanted, but she went back, not for herself, but to help set others free. She would say that, I've never ran my train off track, and I've never lost a passenger. She used as her weapons the gospel and a gun. She used the gun not just to ward off would-be hunters who or trying to catch her and her train, but she also used it to help those who she was leading. Uh, she would oftentimes have someone who 
wanted to go back. They were afraid in the journey. And she would remind them that uh, I've never ran my train off track and I've never lost a passenger. Then she would take her rifle and point it in their face and tell them, we're going to finish this. She led some 300 people to freedom. This one sister with the gospel and her gun, 300. She was a champion for those who were enslaved. She said, I, I, I've never ran my train off track and I've never lost a passenger. Not just uh, Harriet Tubman, but Moses, he was a champion. Moses was called to lead his, God's people, the people of Israel, and he did it well. Oftentimes he faced challenges and had difficulties, but he continued to lead. Uh, Moses, uh, in fact, in one incident, he, as he, his practice was, went to the mountaintop to worship. And while on the mountaintop worshiping and talking to the Lord, uh, Aaron down uh, from the mountain was helping the people out. The people said that Moses had been gone for almost 40 days. 40 days is a long time to be gone. And so, Aaron, we need your help. We need you to make for us, uh, Exodus 32, an idol. We, we need something uh, while uh, Moses is away to worship God with. So Aaron began to make this idol. And, and in fact, as soon as the idol was done, uh, Moses comes down from the mountaintop. And he's got the Ten Commandments, five in one hand, five in the other. And he steps down like a parent crashing in on a surprise party I mean and he comes down from the mountaintop and there they are having a wild party Moses immediately throws the tablets to the ground and he chews them out he literally does and he says these words he says what are you doing you got all this sin on you I'm gonna have to go back up to that mountaintop and talk to God about you and maybe just maybe I can make atonement for you and he did just that. He went back to the mountaintop, and he talked to God about the people. And God talked to him about the people. And he said, God, would you show mercy on them? God, you're a gracious God. God, I love you, and I'm with you, and I'm for you. God, would you just touch them and show them grace? And God did. Moses was a champion. A champion is somebody who gets in the fight, not for themselves, but to help someone else. Well, here in our text, Solomon is standing like a champion. He's standing now in the temple, before the temple, and before the people. I should tell you that this, this idea of the temple was not Solomon's idea. This idea of the temple was David's idea. Many, many years before, after David had won battle after battle, after David had built a house for himself, David said, God, I have it in my heart to build a house for you. He told the prophet Nathan, and the prophet Nathan said, go on, now, do what you want to do. But the very next day, the prophet Nathan had to come back to him and say, now, now God has told me uh, that you are a godly man and a good king. However, you've got a lot of blood on your hands. You, you've been in a lot of battle, and you've got a lot of war and bloodshed on your hands. I, I can't let you build my temple. But here's what I'll do, David. Because you've been such a good and godly king, I will allow your son <laughs> to build the, the temple instead. And so David uh, spent the rest of his life making true provision so that his son would have everything he needed to build the temple. And now David, coming into a little maturity, he worked and worked and worked and built this awesome temple for the Lord. And so now he's standing before the people, and he's letting the people know that we're standing in front of a promise that God gave us some time ago. This isn't some fly-by-night thing. This isn't just happening whimsical. This isn't a passing. This is a God's promise from a long time ago. Look at this amazing temple. Didn't God do it? Look at how God has brought it together. Look how God has prospered and kept us. Look how God has made way. Look what God had. This is the Lord's doing, and the Lord keeps his promises. So he goes through this testimony of how the Lord has given the temple... And he gives us an example of what a prayer from a champion looks like. I hope you pray like a champion. I hope you don't pray like a chump, but a champion. I hope you pray to God just like a champion. I want to show you what the prayer of a champion looks like because all throughout the Bible there were champions for God and they prayed like champions. Here in this text we see that the first thing you know about a champion's prayer is a, a champion's prayer is always selflessly praying. A, a champion goes to God. Uh, not just about their own health and wealth, not just about their own ride, not just about their own whims and wishes and desires, but a champion goes to God uh, with, with a weight on their back that is not their weight. I'm going to carry my, my brother's weight. I'm going to carry my sister. I'm going to take you to God uh, because I love you and because I know God. You see, uh, true prayer in its best sense 
is not just praying for yourself. That's why the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 is not a prayer about self. The model prayer is selflessly praying. In the model prayer, there is no me, no my, no my, but it's us. It's we. It's a prayer that's a community prayer. True prayer is based on the koinonia model. It's called the, the koinonia farm. It was established in 1962, the koinonia farm. The koinonia farm was a community of people who, of, of different races and different backgrounds who all love the Lord. And they believed they should have a true family fellowship. And so, uh, in fact, one of the members of the koinonia farm were the Fullers. The Fullers in 1965 started a different uh, ministry that was based on the koinonia farm. Uh, this ministry said that every person should have a de decent place to live. Uh, every person should have a decent place to live. So since 1965, they've built some 300,000 homes for some 600,000 people throughout the world. Uh, that we call it Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they don't build for themselves. They build for somebody else. That's what selfless prayer is. It's getting on your knees and building for somebody else. It's saying, I want God to do something for them and in their word. I want God to lift them and love them. I want God to bless them in a special way. So the, the, the champion prays first selflessly. They, they, they go to God, not, not all about themselves, but about somebody else. God bless them in a special way. God do something significantly. God do something substantial in their life. So first we see that the champion's prayer it is selflessly prayed. Uh, but not only that, the, the, the champion's prayer is prayed with some sagacity. Now, that's just a fancy word for wisdom. Uh, it's prayed with some sagacity. It's not some silly, uh, it's not some uninformed, it's not some disconnected prayer. But it's a prayer that talks to God uh, from a heart with a little bit of wisdom behind it. it. It's not just something thrown out, but it's something thought out. It's something considered. If you had the privilege to talk to the president tomorrow, Tomorrow, Barack Hussein Obama was going to be in Charlottesville, and somehow, some way, he said, I want to meet with you. Now, you got two minutes, maybe ten minutes, two to ten minutes to talk to the president. I hope you would think about what you'd say. I, I hope you'd go to him and you wouldn't mention your grocery list. You, you wouldn't mention your favorite colored shoes, but you'd have something substantial to say. Well, the reality is you and I have the privilege of going to God every day. Now, while we have the privilege, we ought to go to him with something substantial. We, we ought to go to him saying, Lord, I've thought about this. I've thought this out, and I want to talk to you about this. This is significant and substantial. I, I know I'm in the Bible. Let, let, let me tell you what a, a prayer of sagacity looks like. First, a prayer of sagacity is a spiritual prayer. Uh, it, it, it's recognizing that everything you and I do should be thought of with eternity. Everything we do should be thought of with eternity. What is the eternal goal, cause, and effect for my life? Does this really matter? Uh, God, uh, my life is only going to be 120 years, so God, uh, help me to spend it well. It, it takes eternity into consideration. It's a serious prayer. It, 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 it's, it's not a worldly prayer. It's a spiritual prayer. It doesn't just focus on the things happening in the flesh, but it talks about the fact that we are in a spiritual fight. And at the end of the day, everything we do and say ought to have some spiritual and will have some spiritual. So first, it's spiritual. But not only is it spiritual, it's scriptural. Well, you said spiritual. Well, well scriptural is even better because the scriptures give us a guideline on how to pray. The, the scripture gives us models on how to pray. And in fact, there's so many promises in the scripture. Anything you're going through, you can use scripture to pray about it. If you have need, you can pray and and God, you said you would supply my needs according to your riches and glory. If you lack understanding, you can pray. And God, you said that if we lack wisdom, we could ask for it. And if we believed, you would give it to us. Uh, whatever, it is. if you're sick, you, you can pray that, that, that God, you said to go before the church and, and have the elders pray. Uh, God, by your stripes, uh, I am healed. You, you can pray the scriptures. And when you pray the scriptures, you know your prayer is accurate. You know your, your prayer is spiritual. You know your prayer is scriptural, and you know your prayer is sagacious. But, but let me give you one more if you want a, a prayer to be a wise prayer, a little sagacity in your prayer. Your prayer should be, this may offend you, but don't be offended. It should be short. Do you believe me? Uh, right before Jesus gives the model prayer, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. He says, and, and don't pray 
a whole lot of long prayers with a whole lot of babbling. Uh, see, the pagans think the longer they talk, uh, the more I, uh, God's going to listen. But if you really uh, know God, 